Hello everyone, hello YouTube, this is Felipe Ugato de Salto, or actually today I am Professor de Salto and I'm here to give you a brief history of Samba part 2. Alright, so if you follow the channel and you've watched some of the videos I've made, you probably saw that a very long time ago, it was one of the first videos I've ever made, was actually about a brief history of Samba. And I'll leave a link to this video right here. I highly recommend you to watch that video before watching this one, because it will be a transition. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel, leave a like, a comment, ask questions and interact with me. When we talk about the history of Samba, there are basically two distinct moments in time that um, are very, very different from one another. The first one being Samba when it was forbidden by law, so any type of Afro-Brazilian gathering of people um, to celebrate or to play music or do religious, perform religious rituals was forbidden by law and Samba was included in that category. And then there is Samba as, yes, if you think of Brazil, what do you think about? Yes, Brazil, Samba, Carnival. Today I want to focus into that period of time and history so you understand exactly how that transition between something forbidden and something extremely popular happened. But before we even start, I would like to take you back to the 1800s. It was before Samba arose as a, as a movement, but back then we still had slaves in Brazil and we also had already lots of travelers from Europe coming to the country to check the country out, to know more about the culture. And in 1802, a British sailor historian, I'm not sure how he was, uh, but his name was Thomas Lindley, wrote a letter that I would like to quote to you. He wrote that in the parties of the Baiana elite, so the elite from Bahia, the parties were animated by a seductive dance from the Negroes, these are his words, people, a mixture of Afro choreography and Portuguese and Spanish fandangos. During the imperial times in Brazil, we also had a Marquesa de Santos, so the Marquise of Santos, who were the Emperor's lover and who held amazing legendary parties at her house in Sao Paulo and those parties are known to be really highly animated by musicians, of also Afro-musicians playing Lundus. Lundus is also an African rhythm from Angola. So, what, what am I trying to show you with all of this? I'm trying to show you that from the elite during the imperial times, there, had, there has already been an interest in all the Afro-descendant cultural forms. So basically, musicians back then at the time, like in the early 1900s, 1910s, they were also very, very, how can I say, marked by the elite by the society by the latest imperial era so they also played classical instruments they read musical notes so even some bistas at the time played classical music instruments and were able to read musical notes they were highly influenced by music coming from outside of the country they loved jazz and they all were interested in knowing what was the latest fashion from Paris and what is being played in the Parisian cabarets, what is in vogue at the moment. So if you watched the video I made before about a brief history of Samba, 
I talked in that video about the first ever recorded samba song, which was recorded in 1917, um, called Pelo Telefone. <laughs> And it has a very different type of rhythm. It's more like a mashish. And I would like to name two very historically very important composers for Brazilian music, Donga and Pixinguinha. These two actually composed or were working together on that song from 1917 at Tia Ciata's house. And there's actually sort of a statement from Donga, the composer of that song, saying that he made that song based on machish, which is a rhythm from Portugal, because machish was a, a rhythm at the time that was very much in vogue, and that was considered samba. So especially at that time in 1917, 1919 to early 20s, samba was not seen as a rhythm or as a dance. Samba was actually an event. Like Tia Ciata would invite people to samba at her place, but not as a dance form or a music form. It was rather like a party. So what happened is Donga and Pixinguinha then started a band called Oito Batutas. And this band had an enormous success. Samba and that sort of samba, that very machish European with classical instruments based samba was also becoming very popular. And the eight Oito Batutas, the band, they were hired to play at the waiting room of Sinpale, which was a cinema theater in Rio. And the reason why this theater decided to hire this band, this popular band, to play at the waiting room was to attract more people because in 1918 there was a global pandemic from the Spanish flu that also killed a lot of people in Brazil. This band, Oito Batutas, from Pixinguinha and Donga, they became very, very popular and they performed for an amazing array of celebrities, even for the royal family of Belgium when they visited Brazil, the American Embassy, the General Motors factory, and um, even to the Brazilian royal family. So like Princess Isabel, you might have known, have heard of her. If not, don't worry, eventually we'll talk about her. But even for the Brazilian royal family and Princess Isabel, when they were in exile in France. So they were the now names of samba at the time so in the late 1910s early 1920s and just like any regular mortal person in the world these musicians they were rather worried about making their music selling their music making money being able to support their desires and their families so they were happy with it with samba being that influenced by international songs and international music styles. It was only in the early 1920s when nationalism started growing all over the world, especially in Europe, um, that it also hits Brazil. That's when things started changing and people started questioning why is samba so much influenced by rhythms from, from other countries, from, from European rhythms. So artists from different types, authors, sculptors, classic artists, painters, playwriters, they all started searching for the origin. You know, trying to look back, where did it exactly come from? And in 1922, we had in Brazil something that really changed the scenery of Brazilian art. It was a Semana de Arte Moderna de 22, so the Modern Art Week of 1922, where a collection of artists got together to 
create a resolution to make sure that art is no longer inspired, Brazilian art is no longer inspired by the European standards, which are outdated and boring, but rather inspired from things that are authentically Brazilian. So they really try to achieve a rupture between the influence, the, the artistic influence of Europe and try to create something authentic and original from Brazil. At that time, we had very important names coming together, like Mari de Andrade. Mari de Andrade was writing his novel Macunaíma at the time and was deeply interested in Afro-religion, for example, Candomblé and Umbanda. We also had Anita Malfatti, an amazing painter, who also influenced Tarsila do Amaral, who painted one of the most well-known Brazilian modern art pieces, the Abapuru. So especially after this art movement of 1922, Brazilian artists were really looking for things that were authentically Brazilian. And of course, they stumbled and came across Macumba, that means Afro-Brazilian religious rituals, and they got really inspired. Even um, Mari de Andrade wrote in Macunaíma already things about Orishas. So that's where it really starts influencing also the elite, like the very respectable artists from the Brazilian community and, you know, bourgeoisie, if you want to call it. So, of course, since that started, they were looking for a musical equivalent of that originally Brazilian rhythm. Samba, as I said, is what we knew with Donga and Pichiminha, but there was actually another type of Samba being played at the time, and it was known as Samba do Estácio. So it's interesting because if you are a musician or a dancer, you know that Estácio is the cradle of Samba, berço do Samba. But also, we say that the cradle of samba is the Tia Ciata's house. So, how come samba has two cradles? Was it born at the same time in two different places? No, but you know now, there are two different types. Samba de Stasio is much more similar to the samba that we know today, played by drums, um, mostly influenced by drums as well. So, it was a samba that, it that was not really that much influenced by machish, but rather by a march, you know, and it was very much practiced and played in the neighborhood of Estacio, where the Samba School Estacio was founded, and also in the hills like Mangueira and even, you know, all for other Samba schools. I would like to quote um, something that Ismael Silva, who was a co-founder of the Samba School Deixa Falar, Deixa Fala was one of the earliest first samba schools that ever happened, that ever came to be in Rio. Just for you to have an idea, Deixa Fala, together with two other schools, originated the Academicus do Salgueiro that we all know today. So, Ismael Silva said in 74 that they had to change the, the format of samba, and I would like to quote that to you as well. So he was saying that this, what he said, comes in the context of him talking about why they needed a new different type of samba that was more march inspired, so people could actually parade and walk to the rhythm of the song. He said, in the old style, samba was like this. Tum, 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 tum. That was not possible. How would a bloco walk like that on the street? So we started doing a samba rather like this. Which is what we know nowadays. Now, I would like to point out something very interesting here, people. If you are European, or maybe if you're not, but you've been exposed to ballroom samba, you might actually recognize what Ismael Silva was saying. He was saying that samba was like this. Tum, 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 tum. Which is what you hear when you take a samba class at a ballroom dance hall or, you know, school. And they change it to 
boom, boom, pa chica, boom, 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 and it's funny that the first, the old style samba, which is the original samba in a way, is the samba that was exported, and even people here in Austria know here and sometimes can even dance because that's what they learn at the ballroom dance school. I don't know about you guys, but I think this is so interesting. So, as I said, they started making this new samba and all the bourgeoisie and the new artists inspired by the modernism and the nationalism of the 20s in Brazil started to support the new, this new samba style called Samba do Estácio. Boom, boom, pachica, boom, 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 pachica, boom, 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 boom. So that was a revolution that already started to lay in the pattern to what we know today as the samba that we hear in carnival or even here in Europe when we parade and when we dance, when we play. Basically, it represented a new style that was more rooted in the very, very origins of samba and the drums and was being played in the morros, in the hills of Rio de Janeiro and where the poorer communities, you know, are based. So, there's a one last quote that I would like to read to you. This was said in 1936 by a journalist called Carlos Lacerda who wrote in the Carioca Diary a newspaper, Diário Carioca. Um, at that time, he was an icon of the right wing. Okay, keep that in mind. And he wrote, Samba comes from the people and should stay with the people. The elegant Samba from the parties and the official parties are, is deformed. They, it suffers the deformations of the passage of the music between the poor people for the entertainment of rich people. Samba must be admired where it is born and not being robbed from its creators and transformed in a musical salad to bring money to the in popular music industry. Samba is music from a class and the lyrism of the black skin color lives within it. So basically, you could already see that 1936, so that's, you know, way later after the, the the modern art week of 22 that sh there was a shift in in how people perceived art and the samba and the samba de Stasio definitely became more popular and i would like to finish this video by also saying that in 1960 there was sort of a debate between ismael silva remember ismael silva is basically the one that supported the new format of samba, the boom boom pachica, boom boom boom, which was more rooted in the Afro-Brazilian origins, and Donga, who was the composer and who got the song registered under his name, Pelo Telefone, who was rather, you know, the founder of the samba as a machiche style of music. And they both were arguing, like, um, Donga would say, well, no, the real samba is the samba from, from Mashi. She's like 1917 Pelo Telefone. And Ismael would say, no way, that's not, the, that's not the real samba. The real samba is rather the march. So you see, there has always been this divert, these differences between samba um, and what is very important is to understand that samba was not born as one fixed format of dance or music and then it became a national symbol, but it was really transitioning, okay, and evolving a lot. Now, I would like to ask you a question. Did you know that Brazilian samba and carnival is directly connected to Nazism and fascism? No? So you have to wait and bear with me for the next video, which will be a brief history of Samba number three. And if you're excited about this, please leave a link, comment, 
send a link to this video to all of your samba friends it doesn't matter if you're a musician or a dancer let's bring more people to this channel you will help me and encourage me to keep doing these informative videos for all of us to explain and to show the entire world how beautiful our samba world is thank you very much and see you next time bye